All right, I would like to introduce Dr. Victoria Herman. Uh, and Victoria, if you could please just introduce yourself and where you are and what you do. Sure. Hey, everyone. I'm Victoria Herman. I'm the managing director of the Arctic Institute, which is a small think tank based in Washington, D.C. that focuses on Arctic security. And we have a team of about 30 researchers across North America and Europe working on the many dimensions of Arctic security, from climate change to energy, culture to civic engagement. And I am coming at you from Washington, D.C. in the final days of lockdown. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I would just like to ask a couple of questions about I mean, we've known each other for, well, an indeterminate amount of time, but certainly long enough. And when we first met, um, that was when we were, I was first working on in a civilian capacity and you were introduced to the, the concept of scenarios and simulations and environmental security work. Um, is there anything you remember from that time that you could pass on in uh, workable knowledge for students who are looking at this for the first time themselves? I think my biggest takeaway from our scenario and first engaging in that work was to expect the unexpected and to engage with uncertainty in a real way. Uh, as a student, you don't get many opportunities to be forced to make quick decisions based on half the information that you need. You're usually writing papers where you have plenty of time to do research and due diligence, or you have a week or two to study for a test. And the scenario, I think, was the first time that you had to sit down. You had 20% of the information of what was happening, and you had to make quick and as informed as you could decisions. And that is much more akin to what I do today than any other test or paper that I wrote in undergrad or my graduate programs. And you went on from your undergraduate studies to study at uh, Carleton and then um, at Cambridge. Um, and, and you decided to focus on Arctic security. So what, what was your interest in the topic? I think for me, I first graduated undergrad from Lehigh and moved here to DC. And I first worked on urban transportation in mega cities and climate mitigation in places like Rio and Beijing, Los Angeles, Mexico City. And it was really engaging and creative work, but that wasn't where climate change was making the most impacts. And it wasn't the region that had the least access to political, financial, technical resources. So I thought about where I could make the most impact in the climate world, and the Arctic seemed like a pretty good place to pivot to. That as a white woman in Washington, D.C., I had the ability to be a connector between a place that already had vision and knowledge for how to mitigate climate change and adapt to it, but didn't have access to financial resources and political clout. So that's when I moved to Canada um, and did my master's at Carleton, which I continued to focus on Arctic security, looking really broadly at security for that comprehensive security concept of not just hard military security, but things like cultural security and civic security and how those connect to climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, and that work is something that I continue to do in our National Science Foundation project, um, but also in the collaborations I have with my colleagues in Finland and Greenland um, and in Alaska too. Okay, and, and what is cultural security? Cultural security is rooted in the concept of cultural heritage. And I should say that up until five years ago, I had no idea what that term meant. Um, so it is something that I came across because climate change impacts and culture, who we are, um, how we have lived and how we are living today are intrinsically related. And cultural heritage are what make us who we are. They are both the tangible things like 
cultural heritage and historic sites. They are physical objects. Um, they are archaeological sites, but they're also intangible assets. So things like language, traditions like dance and singing. And cultural security is the uplifting elevation and uh, conservation of those cultural assets uh, from any given hazard. So in my case, that are those include climate hazards, right? So the impacts of flooding on a historic site, the impacts of a fall storm in Alaska or a hurricane in the Gulf impacting a community's ability to grow a culturally important plant or the destruction of an archeological site from permafrost thaw that provide us with knowledge for how uh, people in the past adapted to climate changes and what we can learn from our ancestors. So cultural security includes all of those things. Um, and it's a really broad field that brings together people like me, geographers, with historic preservationists, archeologists, anthropologists, um, in the hopes that we can have a much broader understanding of how we can keep people safe from climate impacts. Um, but also how we can learn from people in the past and traditional local ecological knowledges on how to live lower carbon lifestyles. Okay, and you know, one of the really interesting things about your background um, from when I first knew you, you were, you were an art history major, and you, you seem to be able to turn that into knowledge about how things are represented in the Arctic, um, that for example, people could look at the Arctic as just this broad wasteland with some polar bears and just a bunch of ice. Um, how does that affect how policies are made when, when people have a certain vision of the Arctic that doesn't match with what really is the experience on the ground? Uh, well, now that you have outed me as an art history major, um, I feel really strongly about how the narratives that we construct, how we write, how we take photographs, how we create documentaries about places inform the political decisions and the financial investments that we make in those geographies. For the Arctic, most people will never visit the North, right? They will never travel. Um, to the subarctic or the Arctic. And that includes most politicians, most individuals who will invest in infrastructure, in policy choices, in military investments in the North. And so what they decide is based on what narrative they believe. What do they read in the newspaper? What documentary did they watch last night on Netflix? that happen to focus on the Arctic. Those images, those words inform what they think of a region they'll never visit. And consciously and also subconsciously, they will make decisions based on that overarching uh, narrative that they've internalized about the region. Um, and for my dissertation at Cambridge, I looked at um, about 1,500 news articles and TV clippings about Alaska from the 1940s to 2017 to try to see how decision makers here in Washington, D.C. were making kind of uninformed decisions about the state and what investments and policies they were backing based on what the New York Times or the Washington Post, CNN or ABC was telling them about Alaska rather than local newspapers and what village leaders, what state leaders were saying um, as the things that were most needed in Alaska at the time. Okay, I, I said that in a bit of um, jealousy. Uh, the <laughs> James, James Scott book, Seen, Seen Like a State, came out um, I think two months before I finished my dissertation and I found myself sort of scrambling to rewrite some of the chapters because th these were such great ideas, you know, this idea of legibility and trying to impose uh, visions on, you know, on an environment. Um, and, and unfortunately, I, I had very little time, although maybe that was fortunate too, because then I just had to finish the, uh, the thing. But you and, and I, I mean, together we're, we're trying to look now at how these um, climate change hazards can force uh, relocation of communities. You know, communities in Alaska like Newtuck uh, that then sort of have to pick up and move somewhere else. 
um, and, and how do you keep the community intact if, if that happens. Um, but, but this is really meant to be a lesson for many other places as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. So our new research coordination network, um, which you all should join and join us at our hopefully in-person meetings in the future, um, but also exciting webinars, is focused on movement in the Arctic, right? Communities being displaced, but also cultures being displaced, species ranges shifting north, economies shifting north. And while this is happening in a much more rapid timeline in the Arctic, the Arctic is not the only geography that is seeing these increased mobilities. And it's not the only geography that has to make policy decisions based on going back to those scenarios, you know, 20% of the information needed for all of this movement that is happening simultaneously and is interacting and intersecting with one another. So I think for me, I see the research coordination network on Arctic displacement, migration, relocation as an entry point to inviting conversation with communities in Louisiana that I work with that are facing similar issues in U.S. Pacific territories like American Samoa or the Mariana Islands who are also facing displacement of villages but also of economies and cultures. And in the hopefully not so distant future, we can bring all of these local leaders, knowledge holders, um, scientists, social scientists like us together to think about in the United States at least, in US territories, uh, how do we create informed decisions that can support all of these different geographies that fall within the jurisdiction of the federal government that are being forcibly displaced by climate hazards and have to seek relocation or co-location in other cities or settlements. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, and I'll be sure to post a link to uh, our research network on the video. And um, if, if any of my students have questions for Dr. Herman, um, I hope that I can put them in touch in some way. Yeah, absolutely. Please share my email address, uh, get in touch, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with everyone. All right, thank you so much. Bye.